Good afternoon, folks. Uh, I am some of those things that Dawn said, I guess. So thank you very much for the intro. And I'm going to talk to you about a project that I'm working on with the team of folks, uh, organizing vast quantities of data uh, for Africa in Africa. So, brief history. I work in Digital Earth Australia, which is within Data Science Australia. And historically, our priorities have been to organize Earth observation data for government in Australia. And we've got recently, last year, received ongoing funding to prioritize industry as well. So we organized uh, reasonably large volumes of um, Earth observation data over Australia and make it more easily accessible for government, uh, business, uh, private sector, and hopefully through doing that, um, uh, enable us to make better decisions around uh, what we're doing. There's about 60 people in uh, Digital Earth Australia. We are the primary contributors to the Open Data Cube software, which is what we use to um, make the data available to scientists. Digital Earth Africa comes from uh, Stuart Minchin, who was the previous leader of our group, who, de who decided to pitch at the, the idea of doing a similar thing to Digital Earth Australia over Africa. We received funding from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia and a US-based philanthropic, the Helmsley Charitable Trust, and uh, have, we're about halfway through the project to do this work to make Earth observation data more accessible to Africa. Uh, broad range of applications, mining, land cover, service water, agriculture, somehow because of uh, recent events this year, we are, we are prioritizing making Earth observation data useful for COVID-19. I'm yet to understand how that's possible because the viruses are very small and we use uh, coarse resolution uh, spatial data or produce or make available. But we, um, we do a whole bunch of things and we've got data landing in Africa right now, which is um, uh, being used. There are about 20 staff uh, working on the Digital Earth Africa project, including people within Digital Earth Australia, uh, folks in the US and folks on the ground in Africa as well. So I want to talk about the scale of Africa a little bit. Um, Australia is quite big, but Africa is quite bigger. There are about 3.9 times the surface area, according to Wolfram Alpha, um, as what we have. There's, uh, I think, 49, 50 countries. Uh, and we currently have uh, one complete uh, live data set um, or set of uh, scenes of Earth observation data over Africa. This is the Sentinel 2 uh, archive. Uh, this goes from 2017 until yesterday's data is available. And as of yesterday, there are 1,623,559 individual photos, which contains about seven different bands of red, green, blue, and red of, of data. Each one of those scenes is approximately one gigabyte, so that's um, I think it's big data. <laughs> Happy to argue with anybody that doesn't think it's inconveniently large to work with, uh, but it's pretty big. Uh, so in Digital Earth Africa, there's a few technical principles that we kind of uh, are guided by. We want to collect the best data, so that means um, uh, authoritative, uh, high quality data. Um, we we work on top of shared infrastructure as code, which is to say that the, we work on AWS. The stuff that we do in AWS is based on templates that are public, uh, so you can actually deploy the same thing that we deploy. We try and be un unopinionated, so we have APIs and services and visualizations, but you don't need to use those. You can go directly to the data. We want to do flows of data and then work on backlogs, which means that we've got real-time data coming in soon as it's available, and we want to prioritize doing that and not just do a bulk list of data and then have it slowly drift out of date. We work in the open, so open infrastructure, open source, open data. Uh, and I'd like to make a point that relationships are everything. So the reason why we've got Sentinel-2 data uh, over Africa available now is because of conversations that happen at forums like this with the right people, and you're able to put a little, a little light touch in to help something else that's happening somewhere else and make it go over the line and make stuff, make stuff happen. What's the best Earth observation data? The European Space Agency have a bunch of big satellites up in the northern US, in the States. 
Uh, and the USPS has got a, a long history of um, dealing with oscillations. So ESA, in the optical sense, there is a Sentinel-2 satellite, there's two of them that fly approximately on the opposite side of the Earth, and between them they'll image uh, uh, every land surface in the Earth every five days. USPS has two satellites up in space now of the Landsat family, there's Landsat 7 and Landsat 8, and they've got the historic Landsat 5, which means we've got consistent, uh, same size pixels, same quality data going back to the land, mid land now, which is like 30 years of history of Landsat. Uh, Sentinel 2 is high resolution. We're also looking at getting synthetic aperture radar, so the Sentinel 1 satellites, two of them as well, uh, capture radar data, and we're working on that data. We're very lucky to have uh, uh, support from Amazon Web Services in terms of the public data set program, which means with the volumes of data we're storing, we'd normally be paying something like 50,000 US dollars a month, and we don't have to pay that. Uh, we store cloud optimized geochips, which is a fancy modern way of um, uh, structuring a geochip so that you can read small parts of it. You don't have to download the whole file to work with the data. We use open standard metadata, so JSON um, in the form of a Spatial Temple Asset Catalog document. And as I said, Sentinel 2 is that, that, that product I was talking about before. Sentinel 1 is coming, and Landsat 5, 7, and 8 are coming really soon because the USGS is delivering a new uh, collection upgrade or a reproduction of all of their Landsat data. So, the shared infrastructure code so, CSIRO uh, and us, Geoscience Australia, both deploy the open data cube in highly scalable uh, clusters. We use Kubernetes, we use AWS. And there's a whole bunch of little tools in there that make all of this stuff uh, flow and be uh, responsive, reactive, um, uh, um, really agile. And uh, those templates are available, as I said before. So you can, um, if you've got an AWS account and a, a reasonable amount of technical nows, you can grab Terraform and deploy one of these clusters and have the open data cube up and running in every hour, maybe a week, if you sort of poke around things a bit. I think it's really important to be kind of innovative. And so when I said that we've got these services and visualizations, they're cool. You can go to a web like Wikipedia. Uh, there's a fantastic service. We publish our data out as um, uh, open web services, so WMS, WMPS. Uh, you can load up a map and look at any of those 1.6 million scenes and, and render that scene on the fly with, out of cloud optimized geochips into the web browser. You can go into one of our data science environments and write Python code and load that data, load any of that data, all of that data if you've got enough memory or a fancy compute environment. But you don't need to use our tools. The data is uh, in an open, accessible uh, bucket, uh, uh, AWS service. And for example, uh, Esri have deployed uh, some of their services in the uh, Cape Town region of AWS right next to our data, and they consume our spatial temporal stack uh, metadata and our cogs uh, without having to lift that one and a half gigabytes of data and take their own specific sort of implementation specific version. They just use it where it is, which is really great. So you can go and grab the data, you can come in through the front door and use our services. So we talk about flows and, and the backlog. Um, we're really spending a fair bit of time at the moment investing in uh, uh, like AWS things. So there's a notification that says new data, and we pick that up and we put that on the queue and we process, we send the data to Cape Town and then we index it into our open data cube environment. And that data is ticking over, it's alive, it's flowing. And it's really important with, with data, with, especially with you know open data programs and everything like that. You can be unopinionated and post, push the data out and then other people can bring it in and flow it through. And I know that like, GIS, uh, GIS organizations like X mapping would be invested in services to make sure that data flows to organizations. So I think it's really important to have that flow of data and organize the backlog to make sure that you're in sync with the entire archive um, also. Working in the open, um, Nathan Woodrow talks about open community collaboration, and it's a, it's a big deal. It's kind of one of my one of my side goals. It should really be one of my most important goals is to get more people using the open data cube software so there's more users, and then there's more developers, there's more contributors. Uh, the project gets um, better and broader, more widely applicable, uh, and then that becomes a community and it gets better, and all of that kind of stuff. So 
we do all our working out in the facility there. You can stand on our shoulders just like we stand on the shoulders of all the other open source projects like we are on the others as well. So relationships, relationships are everything, I think. So I mentioned it before that the Sentinel-2 data being available, um, part of its availability is a conversation with a guy called Joe Flasher from AWS over a beer at a conference in Romania and I said, so what can we do to sort of help this move? And he said, well, we could, we could spend some money um, pay, paying a, an organization in Slovenia who are uh, world leaders in EO data to process this data and prove the concept. And then these guys in the US, 784, want to convert that to COG so you can work with them by supporting them with infrastructure to prove that concept. And so we did these little things. So it wasn't really our idea, it wasn't really our project to get all this happening, but but increasing the widgets in a couple of places were able to make that data flow. And that got us um, all of that Sentinel-2 data over all of Africa. And it proved the concept for LM84 to get the pick from Amazon Web Services to repeat that process for the entire world. So now in the Oregon region of AWS, there is uh, every single Sentinel-2 seen since 2017 is available as a cloud optimized directive on the fly, readable for free with open data. And that's extremely powerful and amazing for making our science over the whole world. So with this data, we need we are going to do continental analysis, and we are doing it. And there are some problems around uh, the data. Uh, some parts of Africa here is I think it's called the Gambia is one of the most cloudy rain areas on the earth, and we've. Uh, got here a, um, a cloud-free mosaic. And there are places where there simply isn't an observation of Sentinel-2. There's an observation every five days, and there's not a single observation where it's free of cloud. And so it's very hard to work with this data in remote areas. <coughs> Synthetic aperture radar sees through clouds, and so if we want to do an analysis like look at surface water, we can use that radar data to be filling in these, these um, places where there isn't any observations of <coughs> the land surface, basically. Um, one of the big problems that I'm not sure how to solve is this one, which is uh, internet access uh, by population. So Central Africa doesn't have internet. Um, I've got this idea to build a, like, I don't know, NDBI via SMS. Does no one do that at work? I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, I, I don't know how to make, like for us, we live and breathe the cloud, we're always connected, we can push data around over there, but if you can't connect to that AWS service, even though it's in Cape Town, it's, it's on the ground, on the continent, uh, I'm not sure how to solve that problem. Um, so where to next? We've got um, infrastructure deployed in Africa. We're um, one of the, what they call the lighthouse projects in the new Cape Town region in Africa. Uh, we're working on capacity development. We've got a six-week training course teaching people how to use the data and the software that we, we have. Uh, we are hiring people like, uh, like technical people, like people on my team in Africa. So we want to have them join the team and be on board in the ways that we work so that they can train other people in how to do the same sort of thing. And uh, maybe we work out the bandwidth problem. I don't know. Maybe um, having a way to sort of have a have a takeout version of um, our open data sheet that we can download a, a region onto a, a laptop and go from that back into the app and see what we can do. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I do want to do a quick plug though. Um, we, in shifting that one and a half petabytes of Sentinel-2 data from Oregon to Cape Town, we managed to break S3. We, <laughs> we had about 400 terabytes of data to copy and split it into four passes. Uh, uh, a woman on my team got down pushed the go button and it wasn't going fast enough, so she made four of these things using the S3 replication. And that ended up hammering the S3 API hard enough that it was like a global alarm to the region. That was awesome. <laughs> That's a pretty cool badge of honor, I think. Um, if you want to have a look at it, you can visualize the data at our web map, which is in Terria. Um, there's a training course that gives you a sort of quick intro into it, and there's data science and science. All of this is public open. The data's there. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. Question? No, he, he baffled us with science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, is, would Starlink be a solution to the Africa's connectivity problem? Maybe it will be, yeah. Great idea.